but I also want to especially welcome those educators who are with the IDEC Regional Midwest Conference. I could have said that in a different way, the IDEC Midwest Regional Conference. Welcome. We have actually saved seats for you in the first two or three rows, and so if you want to take those, we would love you to have them. Um, I want to just make one note, and then I'm going to introduce our dean who will welcome you, and then I'm going to introduce our speaker, who's a very special guest tonight. Um, you noticed a great number of students with um, maybe, um, well, this is sort of how they come dressed to school, with <laughs> operable kind of wear, and Rachel likes to stand. <laughs> But I want to um, make special note. Rachel Botten and the, um, the students, a great number of students from second through fifth year, were a part of Color and Couture in Kansas City this past um, weekend, past Friday night. And um, this tribal outfit, um, which was sold by the beautiful model who came out in full character, um, was the winner of People's Choice and of the Judge's Choice. And this actually is from Bentley Carpet, and so it's deconstructed Bentley Carpet. So that's Rachel. <laughs> and the other students that you see with the wearable fashion have just finished this assignment, probably, what, a day ago? And um, it's a way of learning the 3D printer, the laser cutter, different uh, programs. And Dustin Headley, who's right there, is the professor for the digital applications course. And so we invited the students to come so that they could not only be a part of the crowd, but also to um, explain their, their designs and their wearable fashion and um, mingle a bit. So thank you very much. Um, now I'd like to introduce our Dean, Tim DeNoble, who is uh, the Dean of the College of Architecture, Planning, and Design. He'd like to say a few words of welcome, and then, then actually he has to leave, so I'll let him do that. <laughs> greetings. Uh, I just want to uh, extend my greetings to uh, all of you educators that are part of the IDEC uh, uh, Midwest uh, uh, Regional Conference and uh, certainly want to uh, also uh, add my kudos to the students for uh, your work in uh, Professor Headley's uh, class and also um, in the uh, Color and Couture event uh, that uh, went on last week. Um, I seem, I feel like so last century now wearing a coat and a tie like this and seeing uh, what can be done um, with, uh, with, with the capacities uh, that our, these third year students now have uh, with our uh, 3D uh, uh, production applications in, in, in digital technology. So it's very, very exciting. And I think that it really, this, I, I, I think having them here and their, and their willingness to uh, display their, their work um, is really a great indication of what this college is all about that uh, we are an interdisciplinary college, that there's no doubt that uh, interior uh, architecture and product design is a very, very key uh, stone, if you will, in, in the uh, multiple scales of the design and planning endeavor represented in our college. And in that way, I think it's a very, very exciting place uh, where our students learn um, from all the scales that are represented and, uh, you know, Students come out of here believing that uh, what you touch when you reach to go into a building is every bit as important as the sequence of spaces into and, and through that building. And so that's, uh, for me, very exciting, and I'm glad that uh, you are here, and I hope that we can glean um, lots of knowledge uh, from you while you're here. Uh, at the same time, we hope you glean a little bit of some of the wonderful, wonderful aspects that make me proud every day to be dean of this college. So I unfortunately do not get to stay tonight because I have to go do other entertainments, but I do enjoy meeting with uh, a few of you today. So thank you very much. And, and Jordan, uh, a special shout out to you. Um, I, I look forward to uh, watching um, the replay. Of, of, of your lecture, but uh, you have done uh, yeoman's work with our students, and I've, uh, the, the rumble across the entire 
uh, Seton Hall about uh, how engaged you've been um, and, and really how you've advanced this place through your uh, couple of days here now is fantastic and thank you very much. So with that, Kathy, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. So now I have the pleasure um, to introduce our guest speaker. And the, first of all, I need to extend a thank you to the College of Architecture, Planning, and Design and to the Provost Academic Excellence Fund um, for supporting him being here um, to be not only a distinguished speaker, but to be the keynote for our regional conference. Um, thanks goes to Professor Riadi Adidivarum and his, um, his efforts and his um, kind of leadership in identifying and bringing Jordan in and how appropriate it is for the theme of our conference. So thank you, Riadi. Um, personality, originality, magical are all descriptors of Jordan Moser's projects. Perhaps this stems from the education in painting, sculpture, English literature, fashion design, and product design, all prior to earning a degree in architecture. As co-owner and principal of Jordan Moser and Associates Limited, the firm has built a global reputation for consistently original and successful designs for clients such as Disney, Volkswagen, Universal Studios, Barney's New York, and the list goes on and on and on. Jordan has taught at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, the Il University of Illinois Chicago, and the University of Illinois Champaign, and lectured extensively throughout the US and Europe. Um, I have seen over the last two days, as Jordan has participated in studios and a charrette, uh, the natural mentor, teacher, encourager, who revels in imagination and magic and raises it to an elevated level as an expression of story and emotion experienced by people. As educators, we hope our students never lose that sensitivity to live life fully and the part we play as designers of those transformative environments. So as we take a journey this evening, please interrupt Jordan with any questions as we go along rather than waiting until the end. We will have time for questions at the end, but during the talk is most welcome. Okay. Please join me in welcoming Jordan Moser as our AP Design Distinguished Lecturer and the keynote speaker for the IDEC Midwest Regional Conference titled Design Plus Making Process Inextricably Linked. The title of his talk tonight is Walking in Poems. So please help me welcome Jordan. That was wonderful. Hi. <laughs> so let's make this a conversation. So if you have a question, raise your hand. Um, thank you for the very nice introduction, Kathy. If Tim's still here, thank you, Tim. And Riadi, especially, thank you for the invitation. We've been uh, spending a lot of time emailing and talking on the telephone about this. And it's been a real pleasure to come down here and meet so many of you and uh, be in a different place um, and a different situation than I'm in most of the time. It's also been nice to meet David and Dustin and Donna and Tom and Neil and Robert, thanks. Um, I have a laser pointer. It's a little red dot. I live right there, not in the big building, but right there. And this is where I ride my bicycle um, on the weekends, and I ride my bicycle to work. I'm, uh, I live in Chicago, right by the water. And <clears throat> I grew up there. This is my, um, my grandpa, Harry. He, he came from London and moved to Chicago um, to print books and, uh, in Printer's Row, which is uh, an old neighborhood in Chicago that's now been turned into lofts for um, business people. And that's my mom in the middle and my dad on the, on the end. And um, when I was about 15, <laughs> uh, we took a trip to Asia, in part because my, um, my mom had a gallery. And uh, we saw some very unusual things. The most impressive things, things that most impressed me the most were in Bali, where 
everything, um, all the places had designs that, and sculptures and paintings that told stories. And the stories were familiar to everybody. And they were told in, um, in dance. And they were told in architecture. And they were told in uh, paintings. Uh, this is a photograph from last month when I was in Thailand of um, a creature that tells a similar story. There are also a lot of details. In um, Chicago, we did a really good thing for architects and builders. We burned the place down in 1871. So we got to build it up again. And it's been a very interesting place to grow up because uh, there's lots of modern architecture. They, um, the city's built on a grid, and the buildings are, um, for the most part, really beautiful and were, in their day, very experimental. It's, uh, it's a modern city visually, but it's um, not as spread out as some modern cities like Los Angeles. It's centralized, so you can ride your bicycle around on, along the lake. Um, my dad passed away when I was 15, and um, I was a little bit confused, and I thought about being a doctor like him. But I get upset when I see blood, and so <laughs> when I got to Madison, Wisconsin, I went to the Art Institute of Chicago, um, and graduated high school early and start, 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 started to study painting and sculpture. And my mom said, uh, you can't be an artist. You have to make a living. I said, I, I'm going to work hard. And she said, I want you to think about some other things to do. So I went to University of Wisconsin. And um, I got a job in a psych ward. And I started taking pre-med classes. And, um, but blood really grossed me out. And I got upset when people were um, hurt. And um, so in the psych ward, um, it was very interesting to me. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe I should be a shrink. And I had a cousin um, in England who a, was a, a well-known psychiatrist. And um, around that time, I saw a play called Equus by Peter Schaefer. And in the play, there's a psychiatrist who uh, has a patient who has uh, some troubles. And his colleague says, you have to help this kid. And the psychiatrist says, I don't want to take away his passion. And his colleague says, um, you have the ability to make this person who sees the world differently see it like everybody else. And it's your job. It's your duty to help him. So that summer, just after seeing that play, a couple months later, I took a landscape painting class with a fellow named Skaggs. And he was a good landscape painter. We sat, we sat outside. It was called plain air painting. And one day it rained, so we didn't sit outside. And we went to the Art Institute. And there was this painting there. And can you see that arrow? Um, the painting is by Van Gogh. And Van Gogh um, was feeling impatient. And he took the knife that he mixed his paints with, and he scraped the paint off, because he was feeling too impatient to use his uh, uh, paintbrush. And he kind of slashed the paint onto the canvas. And in, at the Art Institute, standing in front of the painting, Mr. Skagg says, you know, next time you see a cypress tree like that, um, you're going to see the pattern in there. And I thought, oh, here's an artist, and his job is to take, um, to see things differently for normal people. I thought, it's the same process that I'm interested in, but I like going from left to right better than right to left. And so it was kind of a moment of clarity, sunshine because I'd been really kind of upset and confused about what to do. So I uh, finished up at Wisconsin and went and got a product design degree at University of Illinois. And then I went and got an architecture degree from University of Illinois. And I went back to the Art Institute for a little bit of sculpture. And I was apprenticed to a sculptor then. And um, I started designing furniture for restaurants when I was in architecture school. And the uh, I got myself a, um, a space. Uh, I couldn't find a job. It was a uh, recession. You guys probably don't understand what that means. And um, a couple of guys that I was in school with and I started up a, a business. And um, they were about eight, nine years older than me. And one of them went to teach in France. And the other one and I didn't get along so well. And I found myself alone. But I was pretty good at hustling up work. And around that time, my girlfriend, who was an actress, um, uh, was working for this fellow whose name is Richard, Richard Melman in Chicago. 
And I was misdiagnosed with lymphoma. And my dad had died of leukemia, and I was pretty nervous about it and spent most of a year in my studio when I was 23, um, 24, thinking that maybe I was going to die. And um, when the doctors said, well, I'm sorry, we made a mistake. Um, you're OK. Um, <laughs> they, uh, Nancy, my girlfriend, said, you should meet Richard. So I said, no, I'm just going to go get a job. I'm broke. I didn't have very good insurance. And um, I met Richard, and Richard started giving me projects to work on right away. The first one was a restaurant called Scoozy, which just closed after 28 years in Chicago. And after that, we started to work on all kinds of interesting projects, like um, this club called Cairo, which was inspired by um, a little bit. It was actually inspired by the owner's girlfriend's earrings. In, a, in one of the meetings. And at Scoozy, we'd started to do things like paint the awnings in our studio, and we made a big tomato um, uh, with a steel frame in it, and we made it out of resin. And here we started to make uh, the bar stools and the light fixtures and the chairs and the cabinets. And uh, we found that if we kind of between working on restaurants, um, we'd, I'd worked as a contractor as well, because there wasn't a whole lot of work. So we'd design stuff, and then we'd act as the builders as well. And as the economy got better, what we did is uh, we took the management techniques that we had used for um, managing construction, plumbers and electricians and HVAC contractors and carpenters, and we started to manage people that um, handled wood or blue glass or spun metal or sewed things. And um, we started getting kind of stubborn about it, stubborn about the idea that we were going to make as much of the project as possible. So you guys are welcome to ask questions at any point. Around the time, a um, little after we opened Scoozy, um, a director named Peter Wood came to town. And Peter Wood was the director of plays for Tom Stoppard, this fellow, who's considered a national treasure in London. He makes some really cool plays, creates really cool plays. And um, Peter Wood was teaching. Um, he was about my age at the time, and I was about 25. And we were very impressed by him, because he got to have tea with the Queen. He was uh, the director of the National Theater at the time. And, but he liked hanging out with us, because we went out dancing at night and um, hung out on the beach till 4 in the morning. And so he didn't want to hang out with all the society people who wanted a party with us. And we thought that was great. And um, it rained again. Uh, and so he had asked me to give him a tour of the architecture of Chicago. So I told him about it burning down and about the history of Louis Sullivan and Frank Lloyd Wright, Mies van der Rohe. And we looked at some nice sculptures. But um, because it started to rain, we went to the Art Institute. And there was this painting there. And Peter said, uh, Jordan, uh, how do you feel about this painting? And I looked at the painting, and I had architecture history, and I had design history, and I spent a lot of time in museums, but I never had art history. But I thought that I could fake it. And so I said, well, it's a, it's a Renaissance painting, and it's um, right smack dab in the middle, there's this, this kid, and there's a, a door, a, a, a window shutter above, and it's pointing towards him, the light's pointing towards him. There's a lot of light here and a lot of dark there. And, Peter was smiling at me, and I thought, well, here's this really sophisticated guy who has tea with the queen, and he thinks that I know what I'm talking about. But then I realized that he was laughing at me. And I thought, oh, well, what? what did, did I say something wrong? Did I get, get, get it wrong? He said, you know, I asked you how you felt about the painting, and you're telling me what you think about it. And it was a very interesting moment for me, because I realized that I'd gone through architecture and product design school, and we talked about the function of things, and we talked about um, the materials and the structure of things and the code, but we never talked about how things made us feel, which was about all we talked about in sculpture and painting classes. And I realized there was kind of a disconnect. Now, around this time, um, we got involved in renovating some historic buildings in Chicago by the team Kogan and Miller. And um, Edgar Miller uh, had lunch with him uh, around this time, right before he passed away he was in his 90s. He was a real character. And he um, had been building these um, townhomes. They'd take old buildings, and they'd take like th three of them, and they'd glom them together. They'd tear out some of them, and they'd 
make double height spaces like this one uh, by pulling out the floor and they'd plaster them and they'd get curves in the plaster and he'd uh, make mosaic tiles and he'd hand carve the chairs and he'd make leaded glass windows that were, looked like the kinds of windows that they had in factories in the 30s and 40s and 50s when he was working. I was like, wow, that's really cool. And he'd make his own tiles and he would tell interesting stories. So um, this was an influence and it affected me kind of in the same way. Now, I'm telling you this because I want you to know I was in school just like you guys. We've been having these conversations today and um, I realized that there was another way of doing things. I, I had hesitated to go into architecture because some of the glass and steel buildings in Chicago made me feel um, alienated, made me feel blue. So I was living in this loft. It was uh, 7,000 square feet. And I lived there with my girlfriend. And then my brother moved in. And then he moved out. And my best friend and his girlfriend moved in, his wife. And people would come by. And we were the only people that lived in the neighborhood. And They'd have to call us on a payphone, which is a telephone that's on the street. <laughs> and we'd drop the key down on a fishing pole, and they'd open, the, and then they'd walk up to the fourth floor. And um, Nancy got a job uh, acting in Hollywood, and she left. And uh, this guy, Gene, was my neighbor. He was my neighbor because he had a restaurant around the corner. It was a very famous restaurant, and I think it's from uh, 1952. That's 1941. And his wife was named Georgetti. And, I had a dog named um, Ram Lama Ding Dong. He was a collie. And Gene, this is a really famous steakhouse in Chicago, and it, um, it was partially famous because the mob and the politicians used to hang out there. And I was walking around the block one day, and Gene said to me, I got some steak bones saved to your dog. I said, uh, Gene, I'm, I'm sorry, but my dog passed away. He says, well, how's Nancy? So she moved to Hollywood. I said, and your buddy Joe, my landlord is throwing me out, so I'm going to be moving. It was really nice of you. It was great being your neighbor, and thanks for everything. He said, kid, I want you to stick around. I got this old firehouse. I want you to take it and move in. So when I was planning to move to a neighborhood where I could have 7,000 square feet and have my business and, and live there at the same time, I thought I'm going to get a big, mean dog because I'm not going to be able to afford a place in a comfortable neighborhood. And when I moved into the firehouse, I got myself a pig. And the pig had short black hair. And at the time, my, one of my favorite painters was Francesco Clemente, who also had short black hair. He had a kind of never shaved too much. He had a, a, a beard here and short, short hair. And so I named the, the pig Clemente. And the thing is, the pig got really fat. He was, he was really cute when I first got him. And then he got really, really pudgy. <laughs> and um, I met my wife. And around this time, I started working with George Lucas. And uh, I was flying back and forth to San Francisco. And um, Lucas asked me to be creative director of Skywalker Development. And I decided I didn't want a, a job, and I wanted to stay in Chicago. But we had a nice conversation. We worked on some very innovative um, ideas that included um, taking broken shopping centers and turning them into entertainment centers. But we also talked a lot about the collective unconscious, kind of Jungian um, uh, thought. Carl Jung was a student of Freud's, and this is a picture of him. And uh, Lucas liked these mythologies, the stories, human stories, that are the same stories around the world. And uh, he incorporated them into his movies. So around this time, one of my buddies was a chef. Um, his name was Charlie Trotter. He was very famous. And um, not at the time that I'm telling the story. He said, well, I've got a friend in San Francisco. You should look him up. And um, uh, George Lucas said, uh, I'd like to design a restaurant uh, for this uh, project. And, um, and then he closed his company. And we'd been brainstorming this restaurant project. And John Cunin said, you know, this is uh, the restaurant fellow in San Francisco. He said, I want to create a restaurant too. He said, I want to uh, create a restaurant that's for American food, because there's all these winemakers up in Napa Valley. And they're are all these farmers that are growing fresh food. And there's this lady named Alice Waters who's combining food that's uh, seasonal. It's, it, it's, uh, it's harvested the day or a couple days before she serves it. And she's serving it with wine that's grown on the same soil. And we've got this new American food culture coming. And I want to do a restaurant, he said, that uh, celebrates that food culture. And so I wondered, what's American design? 
And um, I said, John took me around to some old restaurants in San Francisco from the 20s, 30s, and 40s, Sam's and Tadich and Washington Square Bar and Grill. Um, a couple of them are still there. I said, John, you want to mimic one of those restaurants? And he said, no, I want to do something new because this is new food. It's new in America. I said, well, what's American? And I said, what else do you like? And we went and we saw 48 Hudson. This is the same Hudson that um, Jack Kerouac and Neil Cassidy were driving in on the road, right? This is the one that thundered across America. This is a true American story. This is a car that is optimistic. This is a, an original uh, American vision. And it's a little bit pudgy. And it's red. And it has kind of a strength, a solidity. There's Kerouac and Cassidy. You guys ever read On the Road? Yeah. And um, it also had, this is a self-portrait by an American painter from also from the 40s, uh, 30s, 40s. Uh, he was a WPA painter named Thomas Hart Benton. And when the Europeans were making abstractions, Thomas R. Benton was doing this kind of heroic, a little bit cartoony realism. And I thought, well, there's an American for you. And then I thought about Popeye, this guy eating spinach. There's a food idea. And so we started designing the restaurant. We always start with floor plans. And we took some of the ideas from those restaurants, those old that had bars that were part of the dining room. We have an entrance here. We walk into a bar, then we have a sunken dining room, and we have raised seating all the way around it so that it's kind of theatrical. But you can see the reflected ceiling plan, the thing started to get a little bit pudgy, like that 48 Hudson and like a Thomas Hart Benton painting. And I made, I got, ran out of time when, uh, after making that plan, and I was having trouble coming up with the perspective drawings. So to loosen up, I started sketching the pig on the floor of the firehouse. And ran out of time. I made this painting. I didn't make an alternative, and I brought it out to San Francisco. I said, John, what do you think? He said, if you can build it on time and on budget, we're going to build this. And we did. We built a pudgy restaurant that was pudgy like that 48 Hudson and pudgy like the pig. We called these our hog-bellied beams. And um, everything was a little bit larger than life. And it was, uh, we hoped, something that was unique and American. The lady in the press decided that these looked like breasts. And she teased me about it for months. And I said, you know, it's a restaurant, and it's about sustenance. It's probably OK. <laughs> we made everything from scratch. The economy was bad. We had been working on multifamily residential projects, taking loft spaces, old factories, and turning them into offices. And we were working on residences. So, And the prices in San Francisco were high. And so we decided to make everything in Chicago and bring it out in a truck. Now, I've been asked to come here tonight to tell you about being a maker, which isn't something that I've just done probably because of an obsessive compulsion disorder um, for, the, for, the, for many years, and because I wanted to make things that were curved and detailed, um, and I wanted them to be ours. So we made this copper arch that was pudgy with plywood framing and sheet metal. And we spun metal to make the body of this light fixture, and we blew the glass for it. And I had a friend who was a fashion designer sew this uh, canopy above to reflect the light and also to cover up the speakers in the ceiling. The, uh, there are little brackets here, and you're going to see them in a second. But you can see everything is curved. That's the host podium. And that was uh, kind of walking into the restaurant and down the stairs from the host podium. We, um, this is our Popeye bracket, right? Popeye flexes, flexes his muscle, and it's holding up the foot rail at the bar. And this was um, what we came up with after listening to 1940s Count Basie music. Count Basie was a jazz musician. And this is what his music looked like to me. The armoire, the coat closet in the entrance, has a belly to it, like mine. It's kind of pudgy. And even the stained glass, which was the same as the stained glass in the, um, in the same place as the stained glass in those old restaurants that John had showed me, the images in there were a little bit brighter, and they were also fat. The, we made the handles for the cabinet by carving wax and casting them in bronze. And this, the line for this chair came from the fender of a 48 Hudson with little piggy hooves. There's a, um, a style of 
Does anybody have any questions? There's a style of uh, writing from South America called magical realism. And I've uh, enjoyed reading it I've, uh, for a long time. This is Borges, who uh, wasn't considered a magical realist, but um, was kind of the father. He was blind. And uh, there's a painting on the left side by Salvador Dali. And Borges writes, in my childhood, I was a fervent worshiper of the tiger, not the spotted jaguar that floats down the aisles of vegetation along the Paraná River in Argentina, but the striped Asiatic royal tiger that can be faced only by a man of war on a castle atop an elephant. I used to linger endlessly at one of the cages at the zoo, and I judged vast encyclopedias and books of natural history by the splendor of their tigers. I can still remember those illustrations. I cannot rightly recall the brow or the smile of a woman. My childhood passed, and my passion for the tigers grew old, but they're still in my dreams. At that submerged or chaotic level, they prevail. And one day, a dream beguiles me, and I realize that I'm dreaming. And I said, say to myself, I'm, this is a dream. I have unlimited power, and so I'm going to cause a tiger. Oh, incompetence. Never can my dreams engender the wild beast I long for. The tiger appears, but stuffed or flimsy, or with impure variations of shape, or all too fleeting, or with the touch of a dog or a bird. So uh, I hitchhike around. I, I find uh, people that, I used to hitchhike when I was a kid, back and forth across the country. I was telling Dustin about my time uh, in uh, California. I got there by hitchhiking. I hitchhiked uh, through right, right by his hometown uh, when I was a kid. It's not as fashionable now. Now we kind of hitchhike around the world doing projects for big companies or wealthy individuals. And sometimes they give us big budgets. And I think, I'm going to cause a tiger, but sometimes I can't quite get it right. And so that's my apology for not quite getting it right. This is my friend Mariko. She is um, from an old samurai family in Japan. And um, if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have known what to do when I went to Japan and worked on this project. The, um, the project was to create an American-Japanese fusion restaurant uh, inspired by cartoons in uh, Matsuyama, which is just across the water from Hiroshima on the island of Shikoku. And because in Japan people say hello by bowing, our front door handle was a bronze four-fingered hand. That's what happened. That's what Mickey Mouse's hand only has four digits. And it reaches out like this. So people had to shake hands at the door to get inside. And to leave, they had to give the door high five or high four. And um, these are our Godzilla lamps right here. And they eat sea urchin in Japan. And uh, we made these beer mugs. Let's see if I can, nope. And this is the, this is the room where we had uh, a, a grill and uh, octopus legs for the fixtures. These are the beer mugs and the water glasses with little legs. And that was the door handle to leave the restaurant. Around this time, we got a call from Universal Studios, and we brainstormed ideas uh, that were based on their core stories, which were Frankenstein and Dracula and the Phantom of the Opera, which are kind of gothic romantic stories. And so this was one project that we brainstormed that was inspired by the work of Piranesi, an uh, Italian fellow who made some amazing um, pieces. And we realized some of the ideas from Skywalker development in terms of creating entertainment centers, uh, shopping centers where you could have restaurants and where you had restaurants and movie theaters or IMAX theaters and then impulse retail, stuff that you want but you don't need. And we were asked to develop a project called Mythos. And uh, this is a, an image of, uh, I think it was Narcissus looking at his reflection in the water. And this is the building we built from a clay sculpture, which we digitized. This is about 1997. And there's Narcissus looking at the fountain. We went and, we, uh, went and studied rock in Moab. It was, it was great getting paid to climb around the mountains. And inside, we had this uh, dragon. And because dragons breathe fire, 
we decided that that would be a good place to cook the pizzas. We also were working at Disney at that time. Um, in parallel, this is some drawings we made for a project called Disney Quest. In, uh, this was the Alice in Wonderland zone. Across from the ballet and the opera in New York, we designed this restaurant called Iridium. And the cabinets were inspired by arabesques and porta bras and they had spines. And the columns were inspired by the constructivist uh, theater drawings by Rodchenko, uh, kind of cubist um, humans. Because of course, columns represent people, right? In Palladio's time, a Doric column had the proportions of a man, one diameter uh, to six diameters tall. That was the muscular proportions of a man. The Ana columns were feminine, one to 10. And um, here we had Rodchenko's uh, cubist pieces, and this one was, in my mind, Carmen um, from the opera across the way with flowing skirts. Yes, at this point we are, um, we're making the chairs from scratch, we're making the cabinets from scratch, we're slumping the glass and having it uh, leaded. We're prefabricating the whole ceiling structure, which is made out of rebar, welded together off-site, and then cut, and then welded in place, and then plastered by some guys from Ireland, which is the same way we made the columns. There's Carmen right there. And so, yes, we're making it. This, these are the first bar stools we, uh, we made from scratch. They're made out of cast magnesium aluminum. And they go back to a traumatic experience I had in high school, because I was a springboard diver that wasn't very good at arching my back pointing my toes or keeping my feet together. So to punish me, my coach made me go work out with the girls in dance class. And they wore leg warmers, and they were very flexible and very beautiful, and I couldn't concentrate. It was horrible. So when it came time to design the chairs and the bar stools, I gave them toe shoes and leg warmers and arched backs. <laughs> the mosaic on the floor is inspired by uh, the concept of counterpoint. In music, it's an idea where two melodies kind of uh, play with each other. And we also made this railing uh, to, uh, based on those ideas of counterpoint. The whole floor was prefabricated like a mural. It was uh, made in 18-inch um, squares and then pieced together uh, on the floor um, like a painting. We uh, thought that maybe the lamps should have tutus. We made this by um, carving wood and casting, I'm sorry, carving wax and then making a latex mold, casting more wax pieces, having that investment catch, which is the way you make complicated things like earrings. And then we made a mold for the glass to be blown into so that we get little lines in it. Now, this brings me to the idea of um, method acting. And this is a photograph by Annie Leibovitz of Meryl Streep. And I love Meryl Streep because she's able to transform herself so much. And what we try to do when we're working on our projects is think like, not our clients, but we try and think like the guests. And that's different. I think one of the problems is that, um, and maybe this is left over from international style. International style offers us buildings that are office buildings or residential buildings or retail buildings, but they all look the same. And they're beautiful but they don't tell us the stories that I'm so interested in knowing. And I think too many times my colleagues uh, design for each other, and I think we should probably be designing for guests. I'm missing one guy. Hmm. This is a painting by Alice Neal. I think it was made in the 50s or early 60s. And you can tell from looking at this guy that he, uh, you could tell something about his personality. Now, it would have been much less time consuming if she took a photograph of this fellow. But looking at him, you can see that he's a, uh, he's kind of, he's going to talk too much. He's a door-to-door he's a -door salesman. This is a drawing made by um, Saul Steinberg for The New Yorker. And in the way that he draws each person, something about their personality comes through, right? This guy probably is very quiet and dry and not particularly interesting. And she is probably very present at dinner parties. 
And I like the girl the best because she's fuzzy. She's quite, not, not quite yet formed. And so in the style that is employed, we see something of the personality of the person. And E.E. E. Cummings writes, and I wish I could do a better Bronx accent. I can't do it, so bear with me. Mr. You needn't be so spry concerning questions, Artie. Each has his tastes, and as for I, I likes a certain party. Give me the he-man's solid bliss. For you's ideas, I'll match you's. A pretty girl who naked is, is worth a million statues. Now, at the same time, we were working on Iridium, which was very whimsical and playful. We were working on this other project across town on the east side of New York. Um, the ballet at Lincoln Center is on the west side, and it's a little bit hipper. And the east side, there's more money. And this was a project that was for a restaurateur named Pino Luongo at Barney's New York. And it was very refined. And it was an appropriate style for the customers that were going to Barney's New York. And they were willing to pay 120 bucks in, uh, in the 90s for dinner. And lots of money for special cheese. And uh, it was a fancy place. And it had a different personality. Now Mick Jagger didn't have that kind of personality. And when we were asked to work on some sets for him, we looked at the Gothic romantic literature that we'd been studying with Universal Studios. And we started to relate it to rock and roll. And I'm talking about Rolling Stones rock and roll, not the kind of mod stuff that the Beatles dished out. And these were sets from some uh, productions we designed for him, which I'm not going to get into. Around this time, we're asked by Absolute to create an Absolute poster. And the, the deal back then was that you had to express what you did as an artist um, and use a, an Absolute bottle. And so we took our neighborhood in Chicago and we, and this was unusual at the time, we used the computer to model our neighborhood, which was across the river from the big buildings uh, in the Central Business District. And we made everything out of bottles. We made the elevated tray out of bottles. We made planes out of bottles, a helicopter. The trees were upside down bottles, green. The columns in Marina Tower, which was a very famous modernist building done in the 1960, had little absolute column bottles. And this is the way I drink my vodka with um, ice and lemons. And that's the Chicago River going through. The railing here has absolute bottles. The people are bottles. And even the bricks in these buildings are little absolute bottles. And that is the way that we have been trying to tell our stories to our walk-in poems, right? Is to take a big idea, a concept, and then make sure all the little details follow. So you walk into a dream. You walk into a place where everything is uh, the same. And that's, that's why we are makers. That's why we are motivated to make things. So we met, met Steve Wynn. I was actually walking around New York, and he happened to be there. And his uh, head designer called me up and said, uh, would you work for us? And I said, OK. And um, he was working on a project called Bellagio in Las Vegas. And this is a guy that single-handedly reinvented Las Vegas. And he gave us the north end of the casino to work on. One of the projects was an American restaurant for a fellow named Sam DeMarco. And um, Sam, uh, Sam's American Grill. And uh, these are some of the. This is the plan that we started with. So we knew that we could get the food out of the kitchen to the tables quickly, and everything fit. And we could make sure that everything was on budget, and that we could get out of there if there was a fire. And we could get the garbage out and the new product in through these doors in the back. So I would start with a plan. And then we made a painting, kind of playing with these ideas of the uh, American Southwest. And then we built it, and we prefabricated all of the plaster is very expensive in Las Vegas. And so we prefabricated all the plaster framing with a guy that we'd met in Frankfurt, Germany. And we brought it to there, numbered. And we assembled it on site. And then we plastered it with a half German team and a half Las Vegas Union team. And this was the host podium, which we made in Chicago. The brackets there are made out of cast magnesium aluminum. So we carved it in wood, and then we cast it in aluminum. The seats were made the same way. And uh, we made the walls out of copper and copper castings. And we bathed the copper in acid, and we treated it with fire. And we brought it out in, uh, on a truck, stacked up. And then we riv it was pre-drilled, and we riveted it into, onto the walls. 
And next to it, we want to create a contrast because context is very important. And when I'm in Las Vegas, I'm always a little bit dry. And so, and if I ever get a tattooed, it's going to say, will spoil if not refrigerated, because I don't like to be too hot. Mm. So when they asked us to design a bar in Las Vegas, we thought we'd make something that was cool and melting. So the bar melts into the floor. It's all made out of terrazzo with little bits of glass in it. And we made the bar stools so that they were, we carved them and then we cast them in uh, a non-combustible and biodegradable resin with a aluminum, cast aluminum uh, footrest. And uh, has a different personality than that yellow restaurant next door, There's a, which is what we want to do. This is where they sell lobster and crabs and oysters. Nobody has any questions. Thank you. Are you going right from sketches to fabrication? Are, there, are, there Are we going right from sketches to fabrication? No, we, um, we go from sketches to dimensioned drawings, oftentimes um, made it full scale. Sometimes we're using digital technology. Oftentimes we're using it. Um, we also carve maquettes. And um, so if we're making, I'm going to show, show you this in more detail in a few minutes, David. But this chair was carved. Uh, we made a steel armature. And then we sprayed it with foam. And we carved the foam. And we sprayed some more on where we made mistakes. And we carved more foam. And we were worried we'd never made a bar stool before. We were worried that it would tip over, we were worried that it would break. And, People like to sue the owners of casinos. So then we, when we were finally happy with it, we made a mold, and then we cast a bunch of these pieces. And I'll show you that in more detail on, if I don't talk too much. Um, I showed you that I was interested in Count Basie's music. And I showed those paintings to uh, the folks in Las Vegas. I said, this is what I think music looks like. And um, they said, you're crazy. I said, yeah, but it still looks cool. And he said, well. This is Bobby Baldwin, who didn't go to, he didn't get an MBA. He got his job because he won the world championship of poker. And he now runs um, billions of dollars worth of casinos all over the world. And he's a fantastic guy. And he likes, Count, uh, he likes Charlie Parker, whose nickname was Bird, because he liked to eat chicken. Yard Bird was his nickname. And Yard Birds, I just learned this recently, were chickens because they ran around the yard. And so he liked a tune called Now's the Time. And we took Now's the Time, and we broke it down visually. And we started to, um, I listened to it again and again and again, and broke it down into about 23 units. And Charlie, this, is, this represents Charlie Parker on the horn. And he introduces a phrase. And um, after he introduces the phrase, first there's a piano lead in. And then he introduces the phrase. And the piano becomes harmonic along with the bass and the drum. And then he repeats the phrase slightly differently. And then he starts, to, in Charlie Parker fashion, to break it down and play with it. And he plays, this is him playing it, playing with it on his horn. And then he stops playing the horn, and the piano comes back in and does a piano solo. And then here's the percussion solo. And then he repeats the same phrase from the beginning. And then the piano signs off. I don't know if the queen ever listened to Charlie Parker. <laughs> she does have her crown made um, by a company in London called Asprey and Gerard, or at least she did. Uh, it was designed, the one that she was wearing there was designed by them. And this is a store that has a very different personality than the restaurant or the bar in Las Vegas, because it's for a 300-year-old company that makes saddles and silver and crowns and um, other things for royals all over the world. And this is one on Bond Street in London. And this is another one we did on Madison Avenue in New York. And this is uh, a split off when they split the company into Asprey and Garrard. This is a Garrard store we did on Rodeo Drive. And those stores are kind of uh, a little bit historical, quiet, dignified. They focus not on the design, because they're not selling design in stores. They're selling products. Um, this is the Cirque du Soleil a photograph from one of their performances. And they created a, uh, a bit for Las Vegas. And we thought uh, we were asked to design a store for them. And the store has a very different personality than the one for the Queen's jeweler. This is Jörg. He's from Switzerland, dancing with his best friend's wife. And 
he asked us to do this presentation on the future of hotels in design in uh, Hanover, Germany. I think it was 99. And at that um, time, I met this fellow, Klaus. And I apologize for being such a bad photographer. But this is Klaus, the, guy, the big guy with the beard, not the little guy. And Klaus has a company called Design Hotels. And he asked us when he took the company public to design this um, stand for him, this uh, display in Berlin. And then he rented a hotel in South Miami Beach, and where I had spent time avoiding the Portuguese men of war on the beach, because they'd sting you, even if they were dead. And we designed this hotel for him. And it was inspired by the coral that we found on the beach, and scuba diving at night and seeing um, jellyfish. And there's a sponge on the ceiling. There's a coral. It was the Royal Hotel that we renovated. And we called this our digital throne, because this was about 2000, 2001. And nobody had computers in the room. We decided to have a computer instead of a television, which was kind of a radical idea. That's the carpet for jellyfish at night. And these are my daughters at that time, Eliza and Chloe and Isabel. And this is Eliza used to ask a lot of questions. This is her desk lamp. And Isabel had really wild wavy hair. And this is a lamp for her. And this Chloe is a really good water balloon warrior. And I was distracted by the shape of a water balloon one day, and she smashed me in the face with a water balloon. <laughs> they would be horrified if, I, if they knew I'd showed you these photographs of them. And so I want, you to, sh want to show you that Eliza is um, m much more grown up than she was in that photograph. She's going to school in New York. And this is Chloe and her boyfriend. And this is Isabel. And, um, this is a fantasy plane by Bel Geddes, and it inspired this uh, wine bar called the Hudson Club. And does anybody have any questions? Donna, did you move your hands for a reason? All right. Yes. Um, the Hudson Club served flights of wine. So they'd take four tastes of wine, which Donna loved, and they'd pick them up with this little device, and they'd put them on your table, and you get f four different Pinot Noirs to sample. And the place had bow trusses, so there weren't any columns. It looked like an airplane hangar. And so we took the idea of flight, and we put wings on the facade. And we had portals that were kind of stretched out horizontally because they were going by very quickly. And those became our windows and our mirrors. And everything had a horizontal line, and the light was bounced off of the wings. And we had a fleet of light fixtures that shot through the space. And we had a wine bar with 100 wines by the glass. And this was a mural that we did. It was about 20 feet long. And it was an image of the future from the perspective of the 30s. So we wanted it to feel once upon a time, but an image of the future from once upon a time. So it was warm. And soon after that, we were invited. Ah, this is Christoph Stranger. And Christoph is. Um, from Hamburg. And he came and saw the Hudson Club. And he said, this is wild. It's modern, but it's old at the same time. And everything in Germany is kind of new and made out of glass and steel. And this feels so warm. And it's uh, unlike anything I've seen. And he was with a friend, a client named Pierre Nierhaus. And uh, he, Christoph said, I'm going to get some money. We're going to do a project together. I said, sure we are. And within six weeks, he'd raised the money to do a nightclub restaurant in Hamburg. Hamburg is a, a port city. There's uh, lots of ships going in and out of there. It's up north. It also has a red light district with lots of girls um, that wear vinyl. And they're very racy. And in Hamburg, there is a beer called Astra beer. And its logo has an anchor because of the harbor and a heart because of the girls that are for sale there. And it's been brewed in. Um, Hamburg since just after World War II. And they were the ones that gave us, gave Christoph the money so that we could do the restaurant. And so we developed this kind of tavern, um, which only sold beer from Astra and was part of their advertising. They didn't have Al Capone in Germany, so beer and liquor companies can give restaurateurs money to develop things. And the, we're also sponsored by the local soccer team, St. Pauli, and um, they have brown and beige colored jerseys. And so our arches did too. They were kind of dynamic. 
And as we were playing with the idea of hearts, we wondered what would yin and yang look like in three dimensions? And so I carved these pieces and the answer was two hearts, which is also kind of sexy. And these, this painting of two hearts in an embrace and these sculptures of the hearts um, decorated the walls of the restaurant, which was called Herzblut, which literally is interpreted as heart blood, but means passion. And these are the murals that were on the wall. This is an image of Miyamoto Musashi. He was a famous philosopher, warrior from, he lived just after Shakespeare in uh, Japan. And he was a strategist. And strategy is very important in design. And Christoph came back right after we'd finished Herzblut and it was clear that people loved it. It's still going really well. And he said, I want to take you for a walk. And I said, I'm in the middle of making photographs, Christoph. He's like my brother. He, we get on each other's nerves sometimes. And I said, let me finish, finish the photography and then we'll take a walk. And he said, no, we have to go now. He's very persuasive. And we walked over to see this old building. It had been a foundry. And there wasn't any glass in the windows. And there was mold and pee on the floor. And there was graffiti on the walls. And he said, let's turn this into a restaurant and a hotel. I said, you're crazy. You're too cheap. You'll never give me the money to do it properly. He said, I want you to meet Thomas. And so we went and met Thomas Cryer. And Thomas owned the building and had it had the property zone for an office space. And we started, of course, with um, plans. Started, of course, with plans um, to take the old foundry space here and attach it to the new building and convert the new building from office plans, which had taken 10 years to get approved, um, attach it here. And we decided that we'd chop out a hole on the first floor. So we'd enter here, and the reception space would be here. There'd be a, a bar here, and we could walk into the restaurant and look down on the restaurant on the lower level, or walk across to the beanbag lounge or over here to the bathrooms, or we could go to the reception space and then go get a room. And downstairs, so this section shows you the place. This is where you'd enter and go to the receptionist. And this is where I chopped open the floor to create a 33 foot high space with big doors that were about 25 feet high leading to a garden. Um, and the garden is here and the hotel is there. And in the at the lower level, we had uh, lower level of the hotel. We had parking. This was open space. And there were guest rooms and a nightclub up on the top. And this is the restaurant plan in the lower level. And to get light into this space and to have these doors, we had to dig out the backyard, the garden space right here. And we put the kitchen down here. And this is a little model that we made so that we could understand. Here's the old foundry. And here's a new building, a trust building that didn't put weight on the old foundry, which we were required by uh, the city to keep. And we cre that's the courtyard space, and this is the hotel building. And now there, at the time, Christophe had befriended a French fellow named Thierry Begway. And Thierry had a very, very popular restaurant called Buddha Bar in Paris. And even though it was in Paris, they served sushi, and they had a big Buddha in there. And um, they talked to Terry about partnering with him to do a project in Hamburg, but the deal didn't work out. And Christoph says, we should put a big Buddha, bar, bu a big Buddha in, our, in our place. And I said, you know, that, that doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem, um, it's, a, it's a sacred um, image. It doesn't seem right for us to use that in a, in a nightclub restaurant. And this is a, an image in Thailand, and um, this is uh, a Buddha. And this is... Uh, the palace at Brighton, which is interesting because the details are inspired by Asian, kind of pan-Asian uh, architecture, but they're arranged in kind of a British neoclassical way. And so nothing's quite right. You can see that the, the building has kind of Gothic elements, but it has a detail here that comes from, I think, from Burmese architecture with the serrated arches. That's my cousin um, right there. And this is my daughter, Chloe, at the time, at home. 
This is spider skin, an electron microscope photograph. But I'm not going to talk about that right now. So when you're a Westerner in Asia for the first time, you feel a little bit out of place. and Everything's a little bit unusual. Things don't look like they do here. And sometimes there are military people on the sidewalk. And it's, uh, it's a little bit unusual. And when you're in Germany, you usually don't th see things that are as imperfect and beautiful as this flaking paint. This is the logo we came up with for East, based on kind of uh, inspired by some Chinese chops. And this is a watercolor that we designed with the idea that we wanted to create a hotel and a restaurant that uh, made you feel the way you felt as a Westerner on your first trip to Asia, and that preserved some of the elements of the old foundry. This is a plan of the guest room. We didn't have room for chairs and all of the uh, wingback chairs, Cecil's uh, 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 lounge chair. So we made a bed that had wings on it that was also a desk and also nightstand. And instead of making the room small, because it had originally been designed as an office, and building a wall here for the bathroom, we made an individual compartment for the toilet, for the shower, for the, sorry, I'm thinking in German, for the clothes hanging. And then we put the sink out in there so that you'd walk in and it would be a little bit unusual. And this was the sketch we made for it with paintings. And we reinforced the old foundry and we dug out the basement and we dug out the garden in the back. And then we started to cut the walls so that you see here that we've cut them so that they could be 25 feet tall. And we reclad the building to make the um, historical folks happy. And we prefabricated plaster framing and brought it over from Frankfurt with the same fellow that had helped us in Las Vegas. And we carved the desk, bed, nightstand. And then we made a mold for it so that we could cast the um, pieces in steel reinforced resin. And we made this little maquette of what a chair might look like out of foam. And um, the place opened. Here's the, there's the old foundry. There's the uh, guest rooms. I'm sorry, the nightclub that's above. And this is the door, colors by Katmandu. And this is the entrance. We borrowed some of the chairs from Las Vegas and Eliza's lamp. And we found the forms for the reception desk uh, from catalogs from the old foundry. These are the candles we made for the entrance bars. Anybody have any questions? Is anybody feeling brave? This is the, the main room. The, this is the 33 foot high space. And there's lots of little places to discover here. It's not all um, quite what you see. So we're going to, in the next slides, we're going to visit this room down here, and then this room over here, and this room up there. And we have a Cinderella staircase over here. So you stop at the top like Cinderella. She's arriving at the ball. Everybody looks at you, and then you walk downstairs to the restaurant. Yes? What was your time frame for this project? What was our time frame? 15 months. That's the top of the Cinderella staircase at the birthday party for the restaurant last month. And this is uh, some of the space. This is the chair that you saw the maquette for. It's made out of resin that has color mixed into it so that as it gets scratched, it's the same color on the inside that it is on the outside. So sustainability is also how long something lasts. So we haven't been staining wood floors or wood bars. We've been picking out a species that has the right color and then just sealing it and with oil so that it's easy to reseal it again. And we've been using massive um, pieces of stone, uh, uh, stuff that not, as opposed to uh, gla glazed tile or something that might scratch off. And um, this is uh, acid washed magnesium aluminum question mark lamp. It's Eliza's little question. That's my daughter. And this is the old foundry on this side and the hotel on this side and a party in the garden space in the center. This is a good party. And this is the room that's underneath here. So that's a little bit of a surprise, right? A little bit of the mystery that you might find in Asia. And just above it is this room where you sit on bean bags. And there are tables that are 
cast out of magnesium and aluminum and some sculptures. We call them our dancing yin-yang sculptures. And this is the lounge at the top floor, which is up there. Oops. Yes? We subcontract things, so a couple hundred, yeah. Most of them were in America because when we first started working on it, we were going to make everything in Italy because you could buy a euro for 91 cents when we first, first started working on it. But within those 15 months, the euro changed from costing 91 cents to costing about a buck 33, and it made sense to make things in Chicago and save the time over the water and the reimbursable expenses and just make everything in Chicago and ship it over there, except for the plaster framing, which was made in Frankfurt. Each of the rooms, there were four levels, um, were, had a different color and a different smell. The, the lower level was the root. It was smelled like ginger and it was kind of golden. The next floor was bark, red, cinnamon. The next floor was jasmine, the flower, and the top floor was mandarin and orange and smelled like the fruit. This is the elevator lobby with, and this is, I never told anybody this in Germany. Yes? Oh, how on earth did you orchestrate making the entire place smell? Did you do that way? Right, we had, they had signs that Christoph found. And he said, what should it smell like? And so then we came up with the idea. And they do this in Las Vegas too. If in, the, in the morning it smells like um, pine, and in the afternoon it smells like flowers. It's really weird. There's also a lot of textiles there. I never told Christoph this, but um, I told you that we annoy each other sometimes. He doesn't know that these, the legs of this table are actually made out of bombshells that were produced in Chicago um, in the 40s to bomb the Europeans. <laughs> the Bible says, uh, hammer your swords into plowshares, and we take our bombshells and turn them into pudgy tables. <laughs> this is the guest room. And so the plan's there, and you can see the, what we did is we put the light fixtures close to the glass doors so that those become the ambient light for the room. And there's the bed, and we call it a wingback chair for, so that English people could sit by the fire and read a book and stay warm, collect the heat. There they call them orensessel, ear chairs. And uh, there's the, the nightstand, and there's the sink, and there's the mirror. The, uh, the mirror, you can see that the, the glass is etched, so it has the same pattern as the columns downstairs on the ground floor. And the, the mirror has a, uh, we call it the goose goose mirror because cast metal is goose metal in German, and it has a gooseneck on it. The, the sink here is supposed to make you wonder what it is when you walk into the room. This is the goose goose table. And there was a little piece of leaded glass in each room that was a little bit irregular. Everyone was hand poured and a little bit different. We won a lot of awards. This is Christoph, and he's happy, and there's Thomas. And this is uh, Mark Siunas and Anna Marie Bauer. He was, the, he, ran the, he was the guy that shook hands, and she ran the hotel. And he was an investor named Jan. And we were on the cover of magazines and. England and, I'm sorry, England and, I don't remember where this one's, I think this one's in Korea, and this one was in Japan. And after doing that project, I met these two folks, um, Axel and Ursula. I was at their wedding last month. But when I met them, they were working for the largest non-food retailer in Germany, a company called Karstadt, that doesn't make any of the products that they sell in their enormous department stores. For East Hotel, it was around about, it was around a million three. That was for initially 80 rooms and 17,000 square feet of uh, public space, and it was so successful that we added another. We now have 125 rooms. They uh, there was FF and E cost because there we also uh, there's also construction costs and kitchen equipment, which is not included in that number. The project, 
We designed the project so that it would make money if the hotel room sold for 100 euros a night and if the, we sold $3 million worth of food and beverage every year. The hotel rooms um, are around 90% occupancy and sell for an average rate of 285 euros a night. So it's almost three times what we needed to make a profit. And uh, Christoph says it's the highest grossing restaurant in Germany of a uh, country of 85 million. And the last time I translated the gross numbers into dollars, it was about $25 million a year. So that's something like eight times higher than. So it justified uh, project costs. Um, I'm going to see if I can blow this up. Karstadt was a, a project where we were asked to apply some of the ideas that we'd developed for George Lucas and Disney and Universal to a struggling department store. Um, and I went to the board and I said, I've walked through your stores and this is the way it feels and this is what we need to do to it. And it says, at the top there, it says, hello, I'd like to introduce myself. My name's Jordan Moser. And then it says the same thing in the green space, except for it's punctuated. It's, we need to punctuate it. We need to give a different personality to make sure that there's a distinction between the place where you're buying perfume and fancy scarves and the place where you're buying bathing suits and the place where you're buying towels for your house and the sports zone. And um, it changed their channel. And they started making a little bit of money there. But they had a lot of stores that were in trouble. Around this time, we start working with Volkswagen. My first car looked something like this. And then they changed and started to look like this, the bugs. And this is the cafe we designed for the factory in the center of Germany, Wolfsburg, where they produce about 3,000 cars a day. And they wanted to produce, mm, they wanted to create a space where customers could come pick up their cars. And so when we designed this restaurant, we manufactured everything in Germany because VW is partially state owned. And we prefabricated the walls and we made bucket seats. And we didn't hang any chandeliers down because we were afraid if the restaurant turned quickly on the highway that the chandelier would smash into the wall. So we made sure that everything was flush. And we designed a children's zone because Dr. Piech, the director at the time, wanted kids to understand how a combustion engine worked. And we said, well, that's very nice, but let's create a slide that's three stories tall. Because I don't understand how a combustion engine works. This is one of my favorite projects. It's in Minneapolis. Who's on the shred today? Raise your hands. All right, so this is the site that I was working on. Well, we, we didn't have a poet to dedicate it to. Um, we met a fellow named Scott, and Scott wanted to build a restaurant um, about 15 minutes from the city center of Minneapolis. And this is Scott and his wife, and Josh and Jake, his sons. And this is the cornfield that he gave us to build a space in. Now, Frankly, Lloyd, it isn't right to look out on a prairie land like this and see just horizontals and cubes. I see rolling meadows and crops surfing on them and stands of deciduous trees that are curved. And so when I look out on those prairies, I don't see Frank Lloyd Wright's horizontals. I see forms like this. And by making sketches of the prairie and looking at the shapes, and paintings and pencil sketches and pen sketches. We started to discover what the plan might look like, which is, of course is the way we start things. We have building one, which is Josh, who's much more practical than Jake. This is the main dining room and the bar. And this is the entrance and a little lounge and the bar and the bathroom and the kitchen up at the top and some storage. And the buildings are set in a little shopping center in, um, in a sea of parking. And so what we did in the backyard is we bermed things up so that we didn't have to see the splash of headlights in the restaurant. And we created a garden space that was lined by evergreen trees. And we created one window right here uh, looking inside. And these are sketches for the buildings. And they're just little doodles. And then we made a doodle in foam and painted it white. And you can see the, the berm, the evergreens around the perimeter and the patio space. And there's Josh and there's Jake. This is the parking lot where you enter from. And then we did a computer model because we were building this from the ground up. 
We wanted to make sure we got everything right because we had a, a building that was going in an S shape, but the roof was going in a curve like that, right? It's a little bit crazy, but you can do it out of glue lamb, wood. And we did a bunch of paintings, and we thought, and this looks a little bit modern because people up in Minneapolis and Minnesota, they like to go out to the lakes and they like to hang out in cabins and roadhouses. And we wanted it to feel a little bit warmer. And um, when I think about Minnesota, I think about the Mayo Clinic. And we needed to make a lot of light fixtures up in the ceiling. And we got perforated metal punched to our specifications, which was the difference between the body of the test tube and the lip of the test tube, because Mayo is a research place. And there's my business partner of 22 years, Jeff Carlos, and Scott, and Karen, not my wife, but Scott's assistant, on the when they'd poured the foundations in the floor slab. And these are our abstracted oak leaves, because there were a lot of oak trees around here. And this is our um, site under construction with our glue lamb, Doug Fir, and the walls. And there's a duct right there. And here it is as it's starting to come to life. This is the entrance. And there's the sketch of the field. And you can, I think you can feel a little bit of that field in the, in the image there. Now, the copper's bright because it's new. It's become darkened like a, an old penny. And there are the evergreens. You can't quite see the garden, which is a good thing. There's the oak leaf door handle. So the building acts like a sign on the street. And the door handle, as you touch it, you come in contact with the building. You have a special experience there. That's the host podium. No questions? I thought we, were gonna, I thought we decided we were going to have a conversation. This is the back bar display. We carved these pieces and we cast them in aluminum. And we had mosaics. Um, and we cut them into strips to get some of the horizontals. This is looking up at our test tube babies. So we went from a field to a sketch of the field to a model to the building. And we were very happy at the opening. This is a memorial sculpture we did. And our, uh, some of our ideas about combining entertainment and shopping together um, got us hired by General Growth Properties right before the crash to imagine a whole city. And it would take me too long to explain it. So I'll just show you that sometimes we're hired for, to think creatively at very different scales. And uh, this was to create a city of about 100,000 people in the southwest. And to create about 2 million square feet of shopping. And we looked at some of the most compelling shopping experiences we had throughout the world. And we said, maybe the cars shouldn't be in the middle of everything. Maybe we should have more intimate streets and layers to the street and everything kind of overlooking the street and make sure that the ground floors were either filled with um, cultural centers or retail or restaurants, food and beverage. And let's, instead of laying things out like you would a city this way, let's lay it out vertically so that the parking is downstairs to make the parking safe. Let's have the grocers and the shoe repair stores and the, um, the hardware stores downstairs because they can't afford the same rent as the high fashion folks up on top. This is what Times Square looks like during the day. And this is what it looks like at night. It's a big X. It's the center of popular culture. It kind of gives a place to popular culture in the United States. And Mr. Marriott said, you know, we've been building hotels around the world. And we wanted to make everything the same so that an American traveling in Asia or Europe or South America could get a cup of coffee and a hamburger and know that they had an above ground um, water closet. He said, but now I realize that travelers are interested in having an experience that's local, that tells them something about the place that they're at. He said, can you help us with this? I want to do something that's provocative. I said, what was that word you used? He said, provocative. I said, okay. So 
we started with uh, a floor plan, of course. And this is on 7th Avenue. So this building is right where, at the north end of Times Square, where 7th Avenue and Broadway cross. This is the Coca-Cola sign right there. It's a very famous sign that tickets, KTS booth is just outside the door. And this is the entrance area that um, you come in, and these are the elevators that take you to the second floor lobby, which is actually on the third floor, and goes from 47th Street all the way to 48th Street. We have a kitchen over here, and we have a room overlooking Times Square, because again, this is 7th Avenue, and this is Broadway. And we have a lounge space, and a bar over here, and bathrooms down here. And here are the elevators that bring you up from downstairs, and here are the elevators that bring you to your room. And there was a big X there, and it was, you know, Times Square, right? Times. And it was also a place where there used to be a lot of porno shops before Rudy Giuliani cleaned everything up. And we thought the X's could have personalities. There could be lady X's and boy X's. And we did this study for the facade, the entrance on 7th Avenue, and this study for the restaurant overlooking Times Square from, I guess it's the third floor lobby and a study for the bar. And I started thinking about the columns. Now, we talked before about 1 to 6 were the proportions of Doric columns, and 1 to 9 were the proportions of feminine, ionic, or Corinthian columns. And our columns were kind of stout because it was a big, tall building. And I thought maybe they could have the chromosomes of a woman and be a double X. So the X becomes carpet. And here's our new facade. And there's our column. And you can see it has, it's kind of curvy. It's provocative. Mr. Marriott walked in and said, it looks like a couple of voluptuous women hugging. I said, you told me to be provocative. This is the bar upstairs. So again, we prefabricated the copper on the walls. And we, uh, we pre-drilled the holes. We bathed it in acid, we cut it. You're going to see some of those details in a few minutes. We had the glass blown and etched. We had the fixtures made. The plaster was prefabricated. We made the chairs. The tile was prefabricated. We made it. We were makers. One more time. You know, I never thought about them that way. They were too long. I never had a water balloon that big. But we were trying to get these teardrop shapes. Um, so I don't think they're water balloons. I'm not going to tell you what somebody suggested they look like. <laughs> it's, things get a little bit racy when you use a lot of curves. And, um, but we found that if we manipulated the glass too much, it didn't look natural. And then if we let the hot glass kind of drip off the end of the blowpipe, that it would get, take on a natural form. And we wanted each piece to be a little bit different because in Times Square, there are a lot of very commercial spaces. And in most of our public spaces, things are becoming very, very homogenized. There's too many chain stores. There's too many chain restaurants. And everything starts to look the same. And we wanted everything here to be a little bit different. So some things are bigger, and some are smaller, and some are a little bit yellowed. And the chairs are all a little bit different. Did I answer your question? More or less. This, these are the copper pieces, which we cut out with shears, and then we sanded the edges to make sure nobody would cut them. And we pre-drilled them, and then we attached them with copper rivets to the wall. And this is the space overlooking Times Square. And these are our test tube babies revisited. You can see that they've got little marbles inside them. This is the lobby at the elevator. And our sculpture, our couples. These are made out of bronze and Pennsylvania walnut, which the, the folks, uh, the mill worker found in the neighborhood. The bronze, by the way, is 93% recycled. The aluminum magnesium uh, that we use is 92% recycled. Uh, this is a host podium we made with marbles. And this is the elevator railing, which is also made out of cast aluminum. 
This was my first study for the restaurant, which was called Chop Suey, because it was an American take on Chinese uh, food. And this was a watercolor painting I did as a study for the logo and a graphic study after we'd carved the letters. And then we actually cast them in metal and then photographed them and created this, um, this logo for the restaurant. We also made a bunch of different chairs for the restaurant so that it would feel a little bit more residential as opposed to having all the chairs be the same like they are in this room. We wanted it to feel a little bit loungier. This was our Christmas card in 2010. It was 2010, because an X is a 10, too. This is from Japan. I don't know why it's here. But this isn't. This is the project the Marriott team asked us to do next. Am I talking too long? Should I be quiet? Do you still want to hear more? You can ask a question. I need to feed my children. <laughs> That's why I take on lots of projects. We don't take on projects with people that don't know what they're doing. We work best with people that are really good at um, operating restaurants and hotels and stores and entertainment projects and because um, they understand what we're doing and the value that we bring. And the best people that understand us are usually marketing people because marketing people are trying to communicate ideas about the place that um, we're building to their guests. And they see in what we do um, a story, which is what marketing folks are all about. They tell stories. And they try to connect with their stories and their images. They try and connect to their guests. And that's what we try to do, too, because we're more interested in telling a story to the target guest, which I've tried to illustrate in a variety of ways today. Now we are in trying to tell a story to other designers or architects. Does that make sense? And so. Um, a long ago, I decided that I'd work for people and sell, my, sell myself, but I try to get money for it. I'm being polite. <laughs> this is on 57th Street between Park Avenue and Lexington. It's a hotel that was built in the 20s by a fashion designer named Mr. Bloom. And he wanted to create a women's hotel for what we call flappers kind of modern women in the 20s that were in the arts. They were philosophers, lecturers, academics, dancers, artists, writers. And it, it was kind of a radical idea to have a hotel for women that were in the arts. And it was a cultural center. And um, we wanted to create a space that did not feel like Times Square. We wanted to create a sense of place. And so we walked around 57th Street between Park Avenue and Lexington, and we saw that there were a lot of uh, chain stores and there were a lot of uh, commercial spaces that felt kind of cold and hard and a little bit soulless. And so we went back and we said, well, what, what do we know about this building? We know that it was built in the 20s, the, the jazz age, the, uh, a time when ladies had short hair. And uh, we thought about that for a little while. And then we started working on our plans, of course, because we always start with a plan. So it tells us what our budget's going to be and that, that we're meeting the code and the zoning ordinances. And it tells us, um, it allows us to create a schedule and a budget. So we get all those foundation things together. And then we try and figure out how we're going to give it personality, kind of give it a feeling, the right feeling. So this is the entrance door. And this is the vestibule in this kind of khaki color. And there's a stairway there. And we we'll put a stairway in the window to make you think, hmm. What's upstairs? Uh, and create a question. This is the uh, reception zone and elevators that bring you from the ground floor lobby to the upstairs lobby, which has lots of food and beverage opportunities. These are the bathrooms. These are the elevators that communicate with the ground floor. And these are the elevators that bring you to your rooms. This is the concierge, who's also kind of a guardian. And there's a lobby lounge here and a club lounge over here and a French lounge over here called Opia, and a little cafe, and an event space, and a kitchen. Now, things were, beauty has a way of changing from time to time. 
And in the 20s, Mr. Bloom, the fashion designer, uh, and Coco Chanel, thought beautiful were, was flat-chested women that were very tall with short hair, and they took the waists and they dropped them down. And we got some fashion folks in here tonight that have done some really interesting things that question how um, the relationship between our bodies and geometry and form. And the company that we were working for to renovate this building was called the Apple Real Estate Investment Trust. And so we thought Apple and Mr. Bloom, that's what we're starting with. And so we're going to do an apple bloom. We're going to do an apple flower. And so we studied apple flowers. And they have five petals. And we created this bronze apple blossom. And it became the door handle at the entrance right there. And we looked at the Statue of Liberty and the flowing skirts on the Statue of Liberty. said, so that's a good inspiration for the canopy so that we can get people dry into the hotel from the taxi cabs. And why French? Uh, what's the French influence? We had some French guys that were running the restaurant, Opia, upstairs. And I thought, OK, they're, they're there. They feel like they belong. Everybody in the neighborhood loves them. Let's do that. So there's the stairway, the watercolor study. Um, we did a floor plan, and then we did some very simple um, computer renderings, and then we sketch on top of it, and then I do watercolor paintings on top of that. And you can see that there's apple blossoms in the floor. There are apple blossoms holding the marble on the wall. And you can see that the lines in the room are vertical. We're emphasizing verticals, because that's the line from fashion at the time. And we have Coco Chanel's pearls as a light fixture. This is the lower level lobby. And some sketches for the second floor lobby. And a painting for the club lounge upstairs. painting for a fireplace that wanted to look good in summertime also. So we put some blown glass in it. And this is our bouquet of fixtures up in the ceiling. Oops. A study for the pearls and for the bouquet. This is constructing what we called the collar, which is where the ceiling scooped up to the um, skylight and the framing for the Statue of Liberty skirt canopy from the hotel. And this is Eric blowing glass. And this is the pearls that we created. We're testing to see if they're going to fall on anybody's head in the shop before we deliver them to New York. And this is us doing the same thing to get the pre-cut the cords for the light fixtures once they've been wired uh, before we bring them to New York to hang underneath the collar, underneath that, yes. Um, we break them. How do we transport the pieces? Well, I have another slide, but we break them down so that they're individual pieces. We wrap them in bubble wrap. We put them in a box. We wrap that box in more bubble wrap, and we put it in another box. And then we recycle them. We bring them back, and we stack them up, and we do it again. So that's the way we ship glass. And, and the, the big pearls, which are about 12 inches in diameter, they, they, they sit. We use gravity to let them sit on rubberized steel pieces so that they can be removed and broken down. So we have to think through all that stuff. We have to think through the manufacturer. We have to make sure that the beds fit through the hallways. So we have to measure everything. We have to make sure that everything fits on elevators. And so we, we take responsibility for the whole process. And that's part of what, we, what differentiates us, is that we come up with a concept, a narrative, a poem. So it's not a linear story, right? It's a bunch of ideas about a project. And then we decide what the details can be, how we're going to tell the story visually, three-dimensionally. And then we give the owners a fixed price. Before we've designed this stuff, we say, for a fixed price, we're going to make all these pieces, and we're going to deliver it to you in four months or five months. And it, we're, it's going to include the cost of shipping and insurance and trucks and packing. And it's going to include, and so we have to, we have to break it down um, and, and figure it all out. And it's a blend of what I studied in school. It's a blend of the architecture and a little bit of fashion design, because some of these things take fashion to figure out. Dra pattern making and draping is a different way of thinking than architecture. And some of it's kind of like sculpture. And um, some of it's a lot like accounting. <laughs> Any other questions?
We, we um, the question is, do we always, are we constantly searching for materials? And the answer is yes, we're, we're open to new materials. We, um, we have uh, a lot of artisans that we've been working with for 20 or 30 years, and uh, we're happy with the pricing and the turnaround time. We know we can depend on them, and we like the, the quality of it. It distinguishes our brand from other people. So there's, but we're always, we're always trying to change and try new, new ideas. Um, and so, for instance, uh, over the last year, we've been um, uh, having trees that have fallen down in the forest, taken to kilns, cu cut up to our specifications, and having them kiln dried to 10% moisture content, and then using those big slabs of wood to make things. We also just found these huge beams that were used as partitions along the highway in Chicago. They're made out of this African wood that was brought over 60 years ago. And it's really dense. It weighs almost as much as aluminum. And we've been having these beams um, taken to a sawyer, who has a really powerful saw, and cut into slabs. And um, then we've been uh, uh, recycling them. And it's been a pain in the butt. It's really hard. And it's been expensive. And it's, sometimes they twist. But uh, so we're always trying new things. But we, yeah, we've. Um, We've you, we started out painting resin when we first made resin chairs, and then we started impregnating the resin with colors so that it would be, and then we decided, let's not use resin, or let's invent our own resin. So that's what, I'm working with a chemist now to invent a new resin. We also, um, I'm gonna show you something that we, we made up. Okay. Chair. Maquette of the chair, <coughs> comfortable chair. It took a long time to get there. This is a, a sculpture for the host podium. And this host podium was a mixture of about 5% resin and 95% powdered bronze. So we called it cold cast bronze. It was too big for us to cast effectively, so we actually mixed in the bronze, and then we patinaed it once it was done. So that was a kind of a materials experiment. This is a sculpture for the sink. This is the sink coming out of the sand. This is a sculpture for a table base, and we purposely made each leg a little bit different, and for a matching lamp, and for the buttons, the nuts to attach things to the wall. We tested the fire for the fireplace. So there's the Statue of Liberty. This is the building. We renovated this building and part portion of the building entirely. And we did a light renovation to all of the rooms. And we concentrated most of our efforts on the ground floor, public spaces. That's the new canopy. It comes out about 18 feet. That's the lobby, the stairway. And this is the cold cast bronze. We call these our bud lights because of the flower stuff. This is where you push the button to call the elevator. The apple blossoms in the floor. Yes? It was a curtain along the wall. And these are, these are elevator doors on either side. Sorry? Is that the elevator button? This is the elevator button right there. And that's what it looks like in three dimensions. But it's in a different elevator. Okay. Any other questions? We're at the end. Yes? Yes, I could. Um, it's a little complicated, but let's talk about it. So we didn't, at, at East Hotel, even though it was about Asia, we didn't want to use quotes of pagodas or temples or Buddhas. We wanted to get the feeling of being in Asia for the first time. And one of the things we were thinking about was um, 
that in some Asian cultures, Buddhism, Taoism, nature is, um, there's something sacred about it. And I see some of that in electron microscope photographs of spider skin because the spider skin at 1,000 magnification is really beautiful and complex. And there's even more layers of beauty and complexity at 10,000 times magnification. And that's what those slides were about. It's a little clumsy to talk about it in the course of everything else. I was hurrying. And so that was the, that's the idea. And that's the complexity and the details are what I find missing in contemporary buildings and contemporary interiors. So that's what I consider beautiful and what we're trying to create is a little bit of mystery and idiosyncrasy and l layers of details so that something has a personality. The first time we meet, you're going to have an impression of me, and it's going to change the second, third, and fourth time you meet me and you, as you get to know me better. And our goal is that space has the same layers of complexity and that you discover different things about it as you use the space. That's what spider skin is to me. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. You mean like this brown, oh, and brown yeah. project? Um, we like warm colors. People seem to respond to them well. Um, sometimes we get a little bit more aggressive with the colors. Um, I started out painting, and so I like to play with color. I didn't realize it was that bold. I know that I'm going to show you a project where it gets really bold. And we were doing that consciously, and this project was just inspired by South America. We used really saturated colors because that's a palette that we saw being used. The chef only works with foodstuffs from the Americas, and uh, everything is inspired by uh, southern United States, Central America, and South America. And so the, the palette was really bright for that reason. It seemed to be consistent with our client's taste and the consistent with the food, where the food originated. Does that answer your question? Okay. Nope, yeah. So what I, what I think we'll do right now is um, have those of you who have additional questions, because I know some people are starting to leave and I don't want that to happen, but I realize that people do have other commitments. But what I'd love you to do is, do you remember the poem about the crows <laughs> and the flocking? I'd like you to flock up closer so it becomes that conversation with questions. And that way, those of you who do have to leave won't feel so bad about it. <laughs> Thank you for staying so long. I'm but sorry I, I talked want, so it, much. This is fascinating. <laughs> give you a reminder of us here. Fantastic. In, this is a first edition for our 50th anniversary of our Wall of Fame. So that's Fantastic. So let me, uh, let's first of all thank Jordan and then come up and ask additional questions. How about that? Thank you. Thank you. That was a good idea. Sorry I talked so much. Thank you. That's fantastic. So you got to see our wall of fame, right? The, in the shop. All the I didn't. Pieces. Oh, I didn't. this is just one slice of it.